That's a uh, very kind introduction, and I thank you uh, for that. Those of you who have drifted in from the um, alumni celebrations at Gordon should be very proud of your faculty and staff who have mounted a terrific conference, and the officers of the Conference in Faith and History should also be commended for what has been an awfully good conference with uh, just the right mix of academic rigor and uh, uh, Christian fellowship to inspire, hopefully, ourselves and the coming generations of, of Christian historians. Just a little over a year from now, there's going to be a, another major conference at Gordon to celebrate, observe, dissect, analyze, and otherwise assess the meaning of the Protestant Reformation. I've been privileged to assist Professor Tal Howard as he's prepared for this major event that will mark the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's posting of the theses in Saxon Wittenberg. My own assignment at the conference will be to talk about the idea of scriptura sola as a key factor in the rise and diffusion of Protestant forms of Christianity. Today I'm going to try to do a preliminary report on that assignment, addressing questions about the widely various Protestant engagements with the Bible requires a great deal more careful research than I've been able to do so far. In fact, I'm not even sure when the term scriptura sola or sola scriptura was first used or what exactly it was intended to communicate when it was first evoked. By contrast, I am sure that when Protestants across the centuries have used this or similar phrases, they have intended a wide range of meanings, often very diverse meanings, about their reliance on the Bible. Before next year's conference, I hope to have at least some of these detailed questions worked out. Today, however, I'm confident enough about the vast and controversial terrain of this subject to offer a preliminary answer to the question whether after 500 years, Scriptura Sola has been a blessing or a curse. The correct answer, of course, is yes. And thank you very much. That's the end of the lecture. <laughs> Actually, of course, there can't be any easy or quick answer to this kind of a question. My approach today will begin as a tribute to the millions of Protestant sermons over the last half millennium that have expounded the scriptures to audiences of hugely dissimilar character. In other words, I begin with three points and a poem. Then the paper sketches some of the serious recent criticism that has described negative effects arising from Protestant reliance on Scripture alone. And finally, I'll outline a few of the discriminations that must be made even to begin careful investigation of this subject. The three points are historical moments from the 17th, 19th, and 21st centuries. Each begins with a positive Protestant assertion about the Bible but an assertion that fuller historical context reveals is jam-packed with complex ambiguity. And it'll be the same with the poem that follows the three points. The first is a statement published in 1637 during the rising tide of political religious strife that would soon issue in the English Civil Wars. In that year, William Chillingworth, a protege of the Anglican Archbishop William Laud, was engaged in serious literary combat with a Jesuit who contended that England's official religion led inevitably to heretical forms of Christianity. Chillingworth, who had himself briefly converted to Catholicism before returning to stout-hearted Anglican allegiance, begged to differ with the Jesuit. And so he deployed a full range of his era's standard anti-Catholic polemics to defend the assertion of his book's title the religion of Protestants, a safe way to salvation. Among his many arguments, Chillingworth's focus on scripture was preeminent. He did concede that the religion of Protestants could not be defined by any one particular individual or confession. Rather, in his words, it consisted in that wherein they all agree and which they all subscribe with a greater harmony as a perfect rule of their faith and actions. What was that perfect rule of faith and actions? He was very clear. The Bible, all caps, big letters, the Bible, the Bible, I say, the Bible only is the religion of Protestants. 
Chillingworth then went on to make several qualifications, but while holding resolutely to his main contention, he said, whatever else they believe beside it and the plain, irrefragable, indubitable consequence of it, well may they hold it as a matter of opinion, but as matter of faith and religion, neither can they with coherence to their own grounds believe it themselves, nor require the belief of it of others without most high and most schismatical presumption. The ironies of Chillingworth's situation have been less often described than his famous words have been quoted. As a disciple of Archbishop Laud, who used scripture to define what the religion of Protestants entailed, Chillingworth himself was mercilessly assailed by Presbyterians, Baptists, and other reforming Protestants who opposed the Laudians, including Chillingworth, as nothing better than crypto-Romanists. Although Chillingworth lived long enough to write against Scottish Presbyterians and to enlist for King Charles I in the first phases of the Civil War, he died in 1644 and so did not survive to witness the full hurricane of reform that Puritan understandings of Scripture unleashed in England during the next decade and a half. Nor could he witness the restoration of 1660 when the return of monarchy in an Anglican established church forever ended efforts by the Puritans to convert a partially reformed England into a full-blown Bible commonwealth. The Chillingworth example is poignant because it offers one of the historically most, most recognized definitions of Protestant religion as the doorway to salvation with the frame of that doorway spelled out as the Bible only. But Chillingworth offered that definition just as the English Protestant world was tearing itself apart over what the religion of Protestants meant, how that religion should work to reform the church, and what it entailed for the body politic as well. The second point, coming two years later, is almost equally poignant. It comes from Roger, Robert Baird, an American Presbyterian who published one of the first comprehensive histories of Christianity in the United States. In a work from 1844, which was aimed at Europeans with whom Baird had lived for some time, Baird tried to explain why the United States evangelical denominations had been so successful in cooperating on so many fronts with such great effect on the public life of the United States. He was, in other words, trying to tell Europeans why, despite the great proliferation of church traditions that made up the American evangelical phalanx, Methodists, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Baptists, Disciples, German and Dutch Reformed, Christians, many Episcopalians, some Protestants of, of, of different varieties, why these groups had been able to join their efforts so effectively. The key for Baird was voluntary, non-ecclesial organizations that drew together Protestants of all sorts to cooperate for Bible distribution, missionary work, education, publication, Sabbath observance, prison reform, temperance, African colonization, and more. Baird stressed a common loyalty to the Bible as the foundation for what today we would call a flourishing civil society. But he also went further to specify how American evangelicals use the Bible. He said, they hold the supremacy of the scriptures as a rule of faith, and that whatever doctrine can be proved from Holy Scripture without tradition is to be received unhesitatingly, and that nothing, can, cannot, and that, nothing that cannot be so proved shall be deemed an essential point of Christian belief. Unlike the Protestants of Chillingsworth, England, a vast array of Protestants in Baird's United States were uniting rather than dividing around the Bible alone. In Baird's rendering, the ideal of Scripture alone was working as it had not worked for Chillingsworth's generation because in America, the Bible was liberated from the encumbrance of tradition even as it was blessed with the separation of church and state. The irony of Baird's claim became manifest within two decades. Firm belief in the God-given character of Scripture, firm conviction about what the Bible said concerning slavery, and firm confidence 
that the other side demonstrated its infidelity by abusing the scriptures were prime factors turning the American Civil War into a holy war. Of course, much else was involved in this conflict, but scriptura sola also played a role. If the Bible alone allowed for slavery, as many in the North, as well as almost all white Southerners, believed it so obviously did, but if the spirit of the Bible, or the Bible's affirmation of the image of God communicated to all humans so obviously condemned American slavery, then the trust in the Bible without tradition that Robert Baird praised was working to destroy the very civilization that this trust had constructed. The third historical point brings us into the 21st century. It comes from Philip Jenkins' illuminating book on how non-Western believers have been reading the Bible, and the book's entitled, as many of you know, I'm sure, The New Faces of Christianity. As one of his many illuminating instances, Jenkins documents a strikingly large number of settings where the familiar words of Psalm 23 have taken on fresh power in the newer Christian homeland. For example, in Korea, during the often brutal Japanese corruption uh, occupation, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, became re reassurance for many who face prison, beatings, and family disruption for practicing their faith steadfastly. Among other majority world locations where this, this psalm resonates powerfully is Ghana, where the Pentecostal leader J. Kwabeni Asamoa Gayuda frequently brings healing services to a close by reciting, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. During one exorcism of a woman possessed by a river goddess, Asamoa Gayaudu reports that along with hymns and prayers, a recitation of Psalm 23 was the means by which the pagan forces were calmed. In such a setting, scriptura sola has become more than metaphorically present, but is functioning as a visibly active sword of the spirit against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. But there's a backstory here as well, that concerns the fuller ministry of the Reverend Asamoa Gayaudu. As it happens, he has cooperated with the Lausanne Continuing Movement to warn believers against the dangers of health and wealth gospels proclaimed in West Africa by new Pentecostal churches. Pastors in these churches often quote 3 John 2, a passage about prayer for good health, Genesis 13:2 about Abraham's wealth, and Galatians 3.14, about the blessings of Abraham coming to the Gentiles, as biblical warrant for their popular message, trust God, bring offerings to Abraham's present day, uh, bring offerings like Abraham's to the present day manifestation of Melchizedek, and God will bless you with health and prosperity. Against this message, Asamoa Gayaudu, who is himself an advocate of Holy Spirit religion, deploys other biblical passages, notably Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. He wants believers to embrace a biblical picture that includes suffering with Christ as well as reigning with Christ. The Bible only in this majority world cameo is fully alive but seems to be moving at cross purposes with itself. Thus, from the 17th, 19th, and 21st centuries, we see with great clarity the power of Scriptura Sola, but also considerable ambiguity that attends this basic assertion of Protestant Christian faith. And now for the poem. It was written by Brooks Hinton as a memorial for a much-loved grandparent who had recently died. Heading the poem is a quotation from Isaiah 64. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf. The poem is emblematic of what Scriptura Sola, when combined with Protestant convictions about the priesthood of all believers, has meant for countless individual lives. 
It's called the gift. After my father's, sorry, let's start again, the gift. After my mother's father died, she gave me his Morocco Bible. I took it from her hand and saw the gold was worn away, the binding scuffed and ragged, split below the spine, and inside smudges where her father's right hand gripped the bottom corner page by page, an old man waiting, not quite reading the words he had known by heart for 60 years. Our parents in the garden, naked, free from shame. The bitterness of labor, blood in the ground, still calling for God's curse. His thumbprints faded after the flood to darken again where God bids Moses smite the rock. And then again in Psalms, in Matthew, every page. And where Paul speaks of, all, of things God hath prepared, things promised them who wait, things not yet entered into the loving heart. Below the margin of the verse, the paper is translucent with the oil and dark still with the dirt of his right hand. It's not, however, surprising that even in the poetic realm, the positive depiction of scripture is balanced by other poems that say something quite different. Thus, a good example to set against Brooks Hinton's The Gift is a late poem by Emily Dickinson that critic Roger Lundeen has singled out as particularly worthy of attention. The poem, as in Lundeen's phrase, describes the Bible as expressing in an antiquated language an attenuated faith. Further, Dickinson treats the bits cobbled together into scripture as resembling the playbill of a cheap traveling show. And many of you, I'm sure, will know this poem. The Bible is an antique volume written by faded men at the suggestion of holy scepters. Subjects, Bethlehem, Eden, the ancient homestead, Satan, the brigadier, Judas, the great defaulter, David, the troubadour, sin, a distinguished precipice others must resist, Boys that believe are very lonesome. Other boys are lost. Had but the tale a warbling teller. All the boys would come. Orpheus's sermon captivated. It did not condemn. Yet what Roger Lundeen adds about this characteristically opaque Dickinson effort is a positive reminder that nothing about the presence of Scripture in Protestant history is cut and dried. For according to Lundin, parody of scripture for Dickinson could be complementary in the medieval sense, as well as dismissive in modern connotation. In his words, she prized the Christian scriptures for their mysteries and assurances, but also sensed their unmistakable alienating strangeness. The tensions illustrated by our three historical examples and by the pair of poems are also reflected in some of the most potent criticism of Scriptura Sola that has appeared in recent publications. In England, during the 1630s and 40s, the tension was between the Bible as a way of salvation and strife over implanting biblical practices as a way toward war. In mid-19th century America, the tension was between the Bible as a firm foundation for democratic civilization and a murky quicksand into which democratic civilization nearly sank. In modern majority world Christianity, the tension is between the Bible as liberator and the Bible as a tool reoppressing the never liberated. And in the poems, the Bible is a stable rock for a stable personal identity and a mysterious object of both serious purpose and personal instability. Little wonder that those who question the coherence, wisdom, or even the possibility of Scriptura Sola have a lot to write about. So what I'd like to do now is to briefly go through uh, four critics, and you, you uh, are all learned folks and know how to use the library and Amazon.com, so I won't have to extend a, 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 this discussion in, in great detail. But I'm going to highlight criticism from two figures, 
Brad Gregory and Christian Smith, who have recently questioned the theological and cultural results of Scriptura Sola, and then uh, pay a little bit more attention to more sweeping criticism that comes from Vincent Wimbush and R.S. Sujir Tharaja, who question the Protestant reverence for Scripture in its entirety. Some of you, I'm sure, have read and are, are certainly aware of Brad Gregory's still relatively new book, The Unintended Reformation, How a Religious Revolution Secularized Society. The book is not without nuance, and it's not as a direct an attack on all things Protestants as, as the title might sound, but it is a, a book that features Brad, Brad Gregory's insistence that what he calls the hyper-pluralism attending Protestant views of Scriptura Sola sowed some of the damaging crops that have flowered into the debilities of modern Western uh, civilization. One uh, quotation of this argument, the principle of Sola Scriptura, which Protestants advanced to resolve the difficulties of medieval Catholicism, immediately became an unintended, enormous problem of its own. Extrapolating from the fact of Protestant pluralism, by the end of the 20th century, increasing numbers of people had made, it, had made either an atheistic inference that no religious truth claims are true, or drawn a skeptical conclusion that it can be not, cannot be known among them which might be true. In other words, uh, Scriptura Sola leads inadvertently to atheism or skepticism. Not this comprehensive, but in many ways sharper for an audience gathered in a meeting of the Conference of Faith and History, is the recent assessment by the distinguished sociologist Christian Smith that what he calls biblicism is an impossible uh, uh, attitude to hold toward the Bible. His, his book is called The Bible Made Impossible. It's a lot of fun to read it because uh, we evangelicals, of course, generate all the time tremendous amounts of nonsense. But, but he, uh, he, he's merciless in pointing out the, the, the depth and breadth of, of such nonsense from people who claim to follow the Bible only and can't often agree with their own teenagers what that following of the Bible means. Uh, Brad Gregory's account of what he highlights as the unintended consequences arising from the early Protestant turn to Scriptura Sola, and Christian Smith's account of the pervasive interpretive pluralism he views as a fatal flaw of much contemporary evangelical Protestantism, these things have a familiar ring. They reprise in sophisticated accounts the complaints that Roman Catholics have long made about the ordering of Protestant Christian faith. More comprehensive uh, uh, criticisms have come uh, not just to the notion of Scriptura Sola, but the whole Protestant deference to a single um, sacred book and what that deference has meant for the world's underclasses when that deference takes place in the world's master classes. Vincent Wimbush is a pioneering student of African Americans in the Bible, has, has published a number of very important books on this subject. His most recent volume is, uh, is called White Men's Magic, Scripturalization as Slavery. In it, he focuses on a book that has become popular in teaching in the 18th century and teaching in the history of race, the interesting narrative of the life of Ola Dau Equiano, or Gustavus Vasa, the African. And what Wimbush argues in his book is that uh, Equiano has to emphasize the scriptures in his own conversion, his own uh, in in introduction to Protestant life, his own arguments against slavery, in order to undermine or subvert a whole culture in which scripture has been used as a force of power to subordinate subordinate classes. Recent celebrations of the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible uh, allowed for a few specific applications of concern over the oppressive results stemming from Protestantism's Scriptura Sola. And R.S. Sujir Tharaja made the sharpest uh, statement of which I'm aware in an essay entitled Post-Colonial Notes on the, on the King James Bible. And this uh, interesting essay that's more speculative than based in, in uh, research is the uh, idea, which uh, probably was true, that the King James Bible only became 
popular and dominant in the way that we know it today in the 18th century at the same time as the British Empire was expanding. And Suja Saraja also points out that at its, at its imperial highlight, Britain, and then he thinks in America's imperial highlight, early years of the 21st century, you get an amazing amount of Bible quotation to justify the hegemony of the strong over the weak. The Bill of Particulars that would define Scriptura Sola as a distinct Protestant curse is weighty. It includes doctrinal hyperpluralism, social disorder, unintended secularization, hegemonic dehumanization, and imperial aggression. To say the least, this is not the Bible that Protestants have been taught to honor as the word of God, to love as the doorway to salvation, and to follow as a guide to holy living. Theological defenses of Scriptura Sola would be in order from those who believe the concept is defensible. But what's a proper historian to say? In the investigation that I hope to be pursuing in the coming months, it seems to me that if there is a credible historian's defense of Scriptura Sola, it will come in response to three questions, or at least three questions. First, compared to what? Compared to what? Second, how does practice relate to theory? Third, what does it mean to follow the Bible alone? So the first is a, a comparative question. Um, even granting, which I do, that much of the criticism of Scriptura Sola hits the mark, are there positive results of Protestant reliance on this idea that, that in some sense compensate for the negative results? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, in extreme forms in the United States, uh, particularly associated with the notion of the priesthood of all believers, Scriptura Sola has been associated with voluntaristic, democratic, anti-traditional, entrepreneurial, and anti-establishmentarian culture. And these traits do facilitate the excesses of Biblicism. Yet they also fac facilitate more positive results. Lay activism, lay ownership of Christian enterprises, great evangelistic energy, a considerable measure of lay-initiated social reform, vigorous participation in Christian worship, extraordinary opportunities for non-elites to receive theological training, skillful exploitation of popular media to communicate the gospel, and not least, widespread assimilation of biblical values in the lives of individual Bible readers. We were privileged last night at the banquet for the Conference of Faith and History to see a short video on the history of A.J. Gordon, the founding of, of the, the Missionary Training Institute that eventually became Gordon, Gordon, Gordon Seminary and then eventually Gordon College and Gordon Conwell Seminary. And I think what I've just read you is a paragraph describing A.J. Gordon and the Gordon institutions at, at their best. Now, comparatively speaking, Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism are models of hermeneutical restraint compared to evangelicals or Protestants in general, uh, as defined by the official standards of teaching, Orthodoxy and Catholicism are clearly ahead of Protestants with doctrinal teaching that's in principle secure, authority that is in principle responsible, and Christian practices that are keyed directly to foundational theological principle. But on other matters, Protestants with Scriptura Sola are way ahead. Compared to the Orthodox, Protestants have been far less beset by linguistic, nationalistic, and stultifying traditional constraints. Compared to both Orthodox and Catholics, Protestants have suffered much less from political struggles for power, the abuse of clerical status and authority, lay passivity, religious nominalism defined by tribal loyalty, and the antinomian combination of ritual observance and personal dis dissip dissipation. So this is not a defense of Scriptura Sola or a defense of Protestantism. It is to say that there is a kind of elective affinity between traits that lead to difficulties when Protestants say we follow the Bible alone, but these same traits have led to exemplary exe uh, uh, cases and situations of, of Christian depth and Christian breadth. So the point is comparative. 
Second question asks whether the individualistic fragmentation that critics see arising from scriptura sola has been in bad, as bad in practice as the concept seems to be in theory. And I think it's, it's, it's patent in any empirical uh, survey that the history of Protestantism re reveals a lot more Bible-oriented cooperation, harmony, agreement, and solidarity than the concept of scriptura sola, scriptura sola and the concept of personal appropriation of scriptures would allow for. Theological terms, I think you'd have to say that there is a doctrine of the Holy Spirit drawing Bible readers together by the same invisible power that inspired scripture's authors in the first place. And in historical terms, uh, you have to go to examples, and of course, you can line up good examples against bad examples, but there are a lot of good examples. And I think perhaps the best example is the wide popularity of the best classical Protestant hymns, although some of the best classical Protestant hymns are also Catholic hymns, almost all of which are solidly grounded in Scripture and attract appreciative singers far beyond the denominational boundaries of their authors. Another example is the ability of individual Protestant preachers and authors to appeal with their directly or indirectly biblical efforts to Christian audiences extending well beyond sectarian or even Protestant boundaries. So I'm thinking of John Fox, John Bunyan, George Herbert, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, Harriet Beecher Stowe, D.L. Moody, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Billy Graham, Max Lucado, Karl Barth, John Stott, the fact that contradictions are found among the work of such individuals may be less important than the overlapping circles of appreciation that have attended their efforts. Still another example are the international events and organizations like the Conference on Faith and History. I don't, I don't think we have time to solve all of the biblically-based theological differences of opinions in this one room before the end of the millennium. And, and of course, you have to decide whether you're post, pre, or whatever about, about the millennium. <laughs> but international organizations and events drawing together people who might actually differ significantly on Bible-related theological points show that those agreements do not necessarily go all the way down. So if you think of the Evangelical Alliance of the 19th century, the 1910 Edinburgh World Missionary Conference, Faith and Order, the Oxford Movement, the World Council of Churches, the Lausanne Congress and World Evangelization. This is a lot of cooperation from physiparous, fragmentary people. No one can deny that Protestants have been fragmented. It's also true that this fragmentation may not have been as thorough as the individualistic implications of Scriptura Sola might suggest. My third question asks, what does it mean to follow the Bible only? And here, it, it's important to discriminate, it seems to me, against several levels of what this has meant. Now, this doesn't, of course, solve all problems by any means, but once these levels are distinguished, investigations become more complicated. So let me follow the lead of Vincent Wimbush and use the example of, of Equiano to illustrate each level. So Scriptura Sola, can be a message of hope, liberation, and salvation, reconciliation with God, to groups or individuals. Equiano was born again and set on a path of purposeful living as a scriptural message of salvation reshaped the core of his being. But then there is also scriptura sola as a guide for individuals and groups to define what it means to pursue godliness. So Equiano followed his understanding of Scripture to live what he considered a holy life and to challenge what he saw as the, the abuse of Scripture to defend slavery. But Scriptura Sola can be used as a systematized blueprint for specific Protestant organizations. So Equiano experienced difficulty finding support for his labors from most of the Protestant churches and denominations of his era who defined themselves as following the Bible alone. And a fourth level, 
Scriptura sola can be uh, put to use as an enforced standard for confessional Protestant nations or entrenched social practices in Protestant parts of the world. And as Wimbush suggests, Equiano certainly suffered as an African because of how Scripture had been deployed to buttress coercive aspects of the 18th century British Empire. So, a last conclusion. It should be obvious that picking apart levels at which Scriptura Sola has operated makes summary judgments about the concept much more difficult. Yet such discriminations are imperative if nuanced interpretations are to emerge concerning the historical career of the Protestant notion of Scriptura Sola. To ask William Chillingworth, Robert Baird, J. Kwabene Asamoah Gaudu, Emily Dickinson, or Oladua Equiano, what scripture, Scriptura Sola means is to receive a host of answers. Only, however, by exercising the patience to understand and then to assess these answers can progress really be made in answering the question whether Protestant reliance on Scriptura Sola has been a blessing for the world or a curse. 